Hi, everyone. Welcome to the And God Said podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant. And as you know, this podcast is offered in conjunction with an online Bible study I teach called Cover to Cover. You can find more information on my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. We are nearing the end here, and uh, today we are going to begin the last of our series, this one on the book of Revelation, offered in multiple parts because there's a lot, a lot to talk about when it comes to Revelation. So let's dive in. This is part one, and I'm calling it a word of triumph. So in terms of authorship and dating, we have the Apostle John as author. He also was author of the Gospel of John and the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He identifies himself as a brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. And that is really just highlighting right there the theme of what we're going to see in this letter, uh, letter book. We'll talk about that. Uh, the dating somewhere between 81 and 96 AD, I think probably towards the end of that time, uh, most likely written while John was on the Isle of Patmos. He had been banished there by the Roman emperor Domitian as a punishment. Uh, this wasn't considered overly harsh, but it wasn't great either because he would have been you know, pretty isolated on that island. In terms of genre, we have three genres operating in conjunction with one another. Uh, the first is a letter. This is a letter. There's an opening greeting. John names his author and audience, and there's a postscript. And then we, we even have letters within the letter because we have the letters addressed to each church. Uh, probably, you know, um, it was sent to these seven churches and meant to be distributed. Prophecy, he tells us it's a prophecy in the, you know, right there in the opening. Uh, also, he notes that John uh, received this vision on the Lord's day while he was in the spirit. So as he's worshiping God, he receives this vision. So very in, in line with prophets and a lot of the imagery that we find just, yes, attests to this being prophecy. Then it's also something called an apocalypse. And this is from the Greek. It means disclosure or revelation. Apocalypses were a common genre of the time. This isn't just something that we find in our Bible or in the writings from followers of Jesus. Uh, they were often dualistic in nature, featuring good versus evil. Apocalypses um, assumed conflict in the spiritual dimension and hopes for some sort of divine intervention. Uh, despite hardships and suffering, they would show God as vindicating the faithful and triumphing over evil. This could be our God if it was written from a Christian perspective or, you know, Roman gods or Greek gods, depending on who was writing an apocalypse. Uh, these were recorded in the first person. They used heavily used symbolism. And then each apocalypse, of course, had its own unique features. In terms of audience, John acknowledges a particular audience and it's seven churches within the Roman province of Asia. Each of them get their own mini letters and we're going to look at those. Uh, as with most of the New Testament letters, there's an understanding that these letters would be circulated. Um, in part, this is implied just because of the locations. Each of these cities are centers of civic administration or postal distribution, meaning that they lie on sort of the main road and so would have made it easier to then parcel out copies to uh, the rest of the churches in the region. So even though there's specificity, uh, there's also generic <laughs> audience implied as well. However, we also have to understand that it needs to be looked at first and foremost as a book that is addressing the believers in the Roman province of Asia in the late first century and giving them hope for the events which they are enduring. There are, of course, layers of, upon layers within this book, but that is the ultimate driving purpose behind it. And so it, it's, as with any book, we need to understand the context of that. Uh, so John, since he's writing to this specific group of people, the main content concerns the Roman Empire and these believers who were undergoing persecution at the hands of Roman leadership. There's a reason there's a lot of symbolism 
it's for protection. If Rome got their hands on this and knew who he was talking about, it would have brought all of the force of Rome down upon the church. So there's some coding here, but it's prophecy. So there's always layers. So yeah, we're talking about Rome. We're talking about John's time, but there's also implications for the end times as well. And there's very clear references to the end times in this prophecy. The purpose of this book was to set all things in light of God's sovereignty, especially as manifested in Jesus, by peeling back the veil between our world and the world to come and giving us a glimpse of how our world looks from God's throne and God's future. Uh, again, there is parts of Revelation that speak to the end times. This is to give hope. This is just how Daniel operated as well, the book of Daniel, where there was end time discussion to show it's all going to come to an end. The suffering and persecution, God will make things right. Uh, the wicked will get punished in the end. Um, so it provides a fancy word, eschatological hope. Eschatological means, you know, theolo theology of the end times and, and God's kingdom and heaven. Um, so it brings hope for believers with no status or agency in a hostile world besieged by dark and evil forces. And so that statement is true of John's time and what these early believers had to deal with in the Roman Empire. And it will also be equally true of the end times when whoever believers are living at that time will have to deal with a terribly hostile world uh, as Jesus returns. So in terms of structure, uh, we begin with an introduction, which gives us this amazing vision of the risen Christ. It's so cool. Then we have specific letters for the seven churches. Uh, then it's we get a vision of God's throne room. And from there, things get really wild. We've got the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. That section is, is chapter 6 through 16, so a huge portion of Revelation. In between each set of judgments, there's like an interlude. And then chapter 17 through 22 feature the doom of the anti-Christian empire and the triumph of God's kingdom. And then we have an epilogue. So in our introduction, we learn that our author is John. We learn the audience is the seven churches in Asia. And we get to see a bit about the nature of this book. It's going to be a revelation. It's from Jesus Christ via an angel. Um, the angel precipitates the vision and kind of serves as John's guide through his tour and glimpse into heaven. And it contains prophetic words meant to bless its readers and listeners. Important to this introduction is this inaugural vision we get of Jesus. And it is so amazing because we have grown accustomed to Jesus the man, uh, Jesus with human skin on, walking around, talking and looking like one of us and being, you know, from all description, rather ordinary in terms of what he looked like. There is one a place in the Gospels in, at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus gives a glimpse of his glorified form uh, for Peter and John and one of the other disciples that got to accompany him there. And so clearly John probably had that in mind, but here he gets treated to the fullness of God, of Jesus glorified form. And it's amazing. He's dressed in a robe with a golden sash. He has white hair. His eyes are blazing fire. By the way, all of this hearkening back to Daniel's visions in um, his book. Jesus' feet are like glowing bronze. His face is like the sun, and his voice is like rushing waters. This is King Jesus. This is the Lord who we follow. It's awesome. Like, he is powerful and almighty and is God. And I just love this vision. And then I love that we get the human side. And here we have finally a complete picture of our Jesus. So Jesus holds seven stars, and this is said to be the angels or messengers of the seven churches. That word used angel for angels is equally able to be translated as a messenger. And so scholars think it refers to like the pastor or the head of each church, uh, that that's who the message is going to, to then disseminate, or even, you know, maybe to like a more esoteric spirit of the church. 
Um, Jesus stands among seven lampstands, which are the churches, and from his mouth is a sharp, double-edged sword. This is the word of God. This is what divides true believers from false believers, true teachers from false teachers, gospel truth from false truth. Uh, and we saw that image in the book of Hebrews. Remember, this use of the number seven is meant to symbolize perfection and completion. So like Daniel and every other person who encounters God, John falls down as though dead. Uh, we saw this with the pro all the prophets as well. Uh, Jesus places his right hand on John and says to not be afraid. So can you even imagine? Because John knows Jesus well. And even John falls down at Jesus' feet, seeing him in this form. Uh, but Jesus reassures him. And then Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last, the living one who was dead and now is alive forever and ever, and holder of the keys of death and Hades. So uh, making very clear that this indeed is Jesus. Jesus tells John to write of what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. So this speaks to prophecy as having these layers of meaning. There's always a word for the present time in which the prophet is writing. There's a word for a near future time, sometimes within the prophet's lifetime or just past it. And then there's a word for the far future time, well beyond the life of the prophet. And that is true here as well. So each of the letters to the churches has an identical structure. We get an intro statement from the risen Christ that encompasses some aspect of that initial vision, uh, not the whole thing, but he'll hone in on different parts of that vision, depending on which church he's writing to. There's praise for the good qualities of the church and or criticisms of its faults. And then there's a promise to the victor related to the blessings to be bestowed in the kingdom of Christ. And then finally, each of these letters has an exhortation at the end, of that anyone, whoever has ears, let him hear. So again, even though these are particular churches, there is this, um, you know, greater idea that this is really meant for all of us. Anyone who is able to hear and listen in to what Jesus is saying and to what John's going to reveal should do so and should take it to heart. Uh, so next we have, or the first letter, sorry, is the letter to Ephesus. We recognize this one. This is the, the church to whom the letter to the Ephesians is written. Uh, this had churches of both Paul and John. It was central to the region, and it contained the Temple of Diana. She was a fertility goddess who was worshipped with immoral sexual acts, and it was considered a satanic stronghold. Uh, Jesus commends this group for their hard work and perseverance, particularly in enduring hardships, forsaking evil, and testing false teachers and teachings. So just a note on that, <clears throat> it is amazing how much Jesus has to say about false teachers and false teachings. That is like the heart of his criticism of most of these churches is the, this false teaching. And it just lines up right with what they were writing in the letters of the New Testament. Like this is a huge issue to watch out for. So in particular, he's, Jesus refers to the Nicolaitans. These were Gnostic-like believers who argued that all things were permissible because they said the body didn't matter, the material world was bad, and so they could do whatever they wanted with the body because the body was inconsequential. And thus they were just justifying all sorts of wicked behavior. And so Jesus commends the, the Ephesian church for not lining up with that, for actually hating the practice of the Nicolaitans. Uh, but he does admonish them as well. Jesus says, you know, yes, you're good that you haven't followed that, but you've forsaken the love that you've had at first. What does that mean? Potentially, it means, you know, perhaps they had become legalistic and lost the passion of following Jesus. Perhaps they were fighting amongst themselves. Uh, who knows? Um, it could be that John wrote um, his three letters towards the same period of time. And so all the things John was addressing in him, his letters probably are applicable to what's going on uh, in this context. Jesus commands them to repent, to turn from their current path and turn back to the path of Jesus to do the things they did at first. 
Uh, what would those things be? Probably, you know, love, excitement, commitment, unity, those kinds of things. Uh, this is interesting. According to church tradition, they listened. So this is the only church that I saw anything about, you know, did they respond or not to what was, was written here. Um, and it seems that they did. They were commended in the second century as being full of the Holy Spirit, doing everything according to the Spirit, and they were called complete in Christ. So that's just interesting. And ho I, I hope the rest of the churches listened as well. The promised reward for obedience was the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So these promised rewards are given in context to each of these churches. But again, that it's a universal reward. So it's meant to be understood that all believers are going to partake in this. And so this reverses the consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve. Now we are granted much longed for access to the tree of life, as well as the presence of God. Then we have the letter to Smyrna. This was a large, quite beautiful city, a center of learning and culture. It was called the Glory of Asia. It was also a leading city in the Roman cult of emperor worship. So in this cult, once a year, the Roman citizens were asked to burn a pinch of incense on the altar of Caesar, after which they were given certificates that marked their adherence to their religious duty. Uh, Jesus' followers did not participate, which caused all sorts of issues, and those are clear in this city. So Jesus praises this church for their faith despite their poverty, and the word he uses is like abject poverty, just they are without anything. And this is striking because Smyrna was actually a very wealthy city. And so, um, again, thinking back to that emperor worship, if you didn't have a certificate that said you were, you know, doing your thing every year and, and worshiping Caesar, then you were prohibited from engaging in trade and commerce. And so, therefore, they are, there's abject poverty because they have literally no way to make money. Uh, on top of that, they're also being persecuted at the hands of the Jewish believers in the city. Uh, so they're astoundingly poor and going undergoing persecution. It, it's a tough situation. So Jesus commands the um, commends them for that, and then commands them to stop being afraid, even though he says their suffering will increase and they will be imprisoned for ten days. One scholar wrote, "For a man to become a Christian anywhere at this time was to become an outlaw." In Smyrna, above all places, for a man to enter the Christian church was literally to take his life in his hands. In Smyrna, the church was a place for heroes, uh, which is just chilling and amazing all at the same time. So what is he talking about? This imprisonment for 10 days, there's debate. Some think it symbolizes 10 years, and that would equate to a time of intense persecution that they suffered under the emperor Diocletian. Some think it symbolizes persecution under 10 of the Roman emperors. Uh, whatever it is, the emphasis is on a prescribed limited excuse me, amount of time. This also points to the suffering ultimately as coming from Satan himself, which lines up with what we read in the New Testament letters, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of darkness. Jesus has no rebuke for this crowd. Clearly, they are going through it and staying faithful. Um, all he talks about is their promised reward. They will receive a victor's crown. This one is cool. So this was a trophy um, given usually to a winning athlete, but also something that would be worn at marriages and special, special celebrations of life. And so the idea here is eternal winning. They're going to get this crown of life. Um, they will not be hurt by the second death, Jesus says. This is thought to be the final punishment of Satan, his minions, and all evil. Next, we have the letter to Pergamum. This was the political capital of the province. There were many temples dedicated to Greek and Roman gods, as well as the Roman Empire. And it was especially known for its worship of a god called Asclepios. He was the god of healing and knowledge. He was represented by a serpent, which is uh, true of medicine today. And they have like that little serpent symbol um, when you see anything like modern and medical. 
Uh, this was home to a prominent medical school and a site where many sick people traveled. This is crazy. Listen to this. So in the temple of Asclepios, you were allowed to spend the night there. So the sick people would come. They would be allowed to sleep in the temple on the floor. And on the floor of this temple were all sorts of non-poisonous snakes. So it was believed that as you slept, if these snakes glided over your form, you would be healed. Right there, like, no, I would be dead because I would have a heart attack. I do not like snakes. The thought of snakes, just like, I may not be able to sleep tonight because that image is so horrible. So anyway, uh, that's just a little fun tidbit for you, which is not that fun. So Jesus commends this church for their faith, despite living where, quote, Satan has his throne. I mean, wow, if that's not a description. Now, potentially, he's calling it this because this is the seat of the Roman Empire. This is the political center. Uh, interestingly, he also acknowledges a martyr named Antipas, but we don't know anything about this man, what he did, who he was, just. But Jesus does, and I just love it that he's calling out people. Uh, so Jesus has a few convicting words and a call to repentance. He admonishes the adherence of false teaching. Here he speaks of the false teaching of Balaam. Remember Balaam from Genesis in the Old Testament? He was the guy, uh, the false prophet, who God confronted via a talking donkey. Um, so here Jesus is referring to a type of false teaching that allowed idolatry and sexual immorality. And then he admonishes the Nicolaitans again. Uh, we already heard about these guys. They approved of immorality because they thought the body was inconsequential. Jesus said the reward for the victorious will be hidden manna, meaning, you know, true bread from heaven, and a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. So a white stone in the ancient world could be used as a ticket to a banquet. It could be used as evidence of having been counted in a census. It was given as a sign of acquittal in a court of law. And it was also sometimes given as a badge of friendship and alliance. And I think all of those work in imagining the significance of this white stone. Uh, what is the new name written on it? it I think it's going to be our true identity in Christ some name that just perfectly uh, speaks to who we are in Jesus. And I, I love that one. I think that's such a cool reward. The next letter is to Thyatira. This was the smallest and relatively least important of these cities, but it was still a city of trade and commerce. And it was once home to Lydia and her house church. Remember Lydia from Acts? Paul meets her when he is has that vision of the Macedonian man and he's turned away from where he wants to go. He goes to this region and the first people he encounters are Lydia and her friends by the river. And uh, he witnesses to them. They believe the gospel and they become an, a very strong house church with Lydia, Lydia as their leader. So this is that group. Um, I don't I presume Lydia was not still alive at this point, but this is the continuation of that church. Jesus commends them for their love, works, and perseverance, all of which were increasing in measure, but he admonishes the false teacher who he identifies as Jezebel. Now that could be definitely a symbolic name, uh, referring to one of the most evil women in scripture. We remember her from the Old Testament. She was Ahab's wife. She uh, was the one who persecuted Elijah and tried to kill him and killed all the rest of God's prophets who were living in the northern kingdom. Uh, whoever this Jezebel is, if that's her real name or not, she was teaching an immoral and ungodly way of life based in idolatry and Satan's so-called deep secrets. Notice that Jesus just doesn't uh, pull words here. Like he really levels people with his... Uh, truth. Um, so probably she's engaging in some kind of early Gnostic teaching. Jesus says that despite patiently giving her time to repent, she refused. And so symbolically, her result will be one of fruitlessness. He encourages everyone else to hold fast to their faith. Their reward will be authority over the nations and the receipt of the morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus himself. 
So our reward is not only authority over the nations, but Jesus. He is our reward. And never a truer statement has been spoken. Next, we have the letter to Sardis. This was a wealthy city that was beginning to decline in status, and it would have been known as a place of easy money, kind of like an old money vibe to it. There was a reputation for immorality, apathy, and decadence. Even on pagans' lips, Sardis was a name of contempt, which is saying a lot. So uh, in terms of the church, there's really not too much to commend here. Jesus is calling them out for their apathy. He says that they have a reputation of being alive, but in fact, they are dead. Um, he says they need to wake up, uh, but that there are a few who have not soiled their clothes, and these would walk with Jesus dressed in white. And isn't that the greatest of gifts? Uh, those who remain faithful are given a closer walk with Jesus. In terms of rewards, oh, he does command them to hold on to the gospel and to repent. Uh, in terms of reward, there will be white clothing and a name in the book of life acknowledged before God's throne. So white clothing symbolizes purity. In the ancient world, they had uh, every city had what was called the book of the living. It was the city registry. And when you died or when you were convicted of a crime, your name would be blotted out of that book. Uh, so note that God's book of life contains our names. The focus is on grace and mercy. So our names are there to begin with. By default, your name is in the book of life. You don't have to earn your name into the book of life. You have to earn your way out of it, if that makes sense. The onus is on us. Will we accept grace and so our name stays? Or will we reject the grace of God and have our name blotted out too? Uh, so, so much good symbolism right there. The next letter is to Philadelphia. This means brotherly love. It was the newest of the cities. It was a center for Hellenism, which is that concept for, you know, um, proliferating Greek knowledge and culture and language. And it commanded the highway from Europe to Asia. Uh, Jesus commends them for their faith, despite their lack of strength. Uh, again, being one of the newer cities, it makes sense that they didn't have a lot of weight also, this was a place where there were a lot of earthquakes and literally like these, they had these gorgeous buildings that were always being destroyed and having to be rebuilt because of their earthquakes. Uh, so they were persecuted by the Jewish people in their community. Jesus says they would be kept from the hour of trial. Uh, no one's quite sure what that refers to. I don't think we're to end times totally yet in terms of prophecy. So it's probably some kind of code for something that was going to happen. Uh, the reward, they would become a pillar in the temple of God, written on with God's name and the name of the new Jerusalem. So I love that each reward kind of speaks to what's happening in the community. Again, this was a place of earthquakes. And so the buildings would get destroyed. And often the only thing that would be left standing were the pillars. And so he's saying, you're going to be that. You're going to be what's left standing. And it's going to be in the temple of God. So how cool, what a cool image that Jesus gives them. Um, so the next and final city that we have is uh, Laodicea, and this is a name we've heard from Paul. This was a wealthy city. It also had a significant Jewish population. It boasted a lot of trade and commerce, including, I guess, apparently it was known for having this like really good eye Self, like ointment or drops or something that people would go there for. And so it's interesting because Jesus in, in his rebuke of them um, says, you know, I counsel you to buy from me so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can really see. So he's, you know, saying your special eye salve, <laughs> like it doesn't matter. You need what comes from me. Uh, this city didn't have access to a good water supply. The leadership of the city had to compromise with enemies because of this. If anyone threatened to kind of lay siege to the city, they just would immediately capitulate because otherwise their water supply would get cut off. So this is a group, this is a city in general that's just going to be super apathetic. Like they're just trying to survive. And apparently the church has adopted this as well because Jesus has no commendation. He only has conviction, and it's regarding their apathy and lukewarm faith. These are the people to whom Jesus says, you are neither hot nor cold. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. That is some harsh words. Again, Jesus does not mince words. 
So there is an empty religion. They think they're secure, but they're really wretches because they're of their fruitless faith. However, they're not without hope. Jesus reminds them rebuke and discipline is an act of love. He wants them to repent and follow him. And this is where we get the beautiful verse of Revelation 3.20. Here I am. This is Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So Jesus is saying, I am right here. If you would just open the door, um, you, would, you would get things right. So what we learn here is we are not too far gone. We are never too far gone as individuals or as a, a wider group of people, a church, a community of followers. There is always a chance for repentance and to return to the gospel truth that we have been given. So the reward is the right to sit with Jesus on his throne. Again, even the worst, most lukewarm of believers can repent and gain access to the throne of Jesus. And that takes us to our next vision, which is the throne room of God. So we've got a bracketing effect around these letters to the churches because we have a vision of Christ, and now we have a vision of God's throne room. And this vision recalls so many of the visions from the Old Testament that we saw. And Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, even Moses has a vision of God that is similar. This vision, I think, probably stands outside linear time. Time is now going to not be so straightforward. It's interesting because John, you know, just had this vision of Jesus. And now he stands weeping because he thinks there's no one that can open the scroll. Uh, so it's almost like he forgot about Jesus or I don't know. I just I feel like somehow time is is different. Uh, but he's reassured that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb, is able to open this scroll. The lamb has seven horns, eyes, and a sevenfold spirit, which signifies perfection and completion. This lamb was slain and with his blood purchased persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and made them a priesthood to serve God. So this is Jesus, and we are that priesthood. The lamb is worshipped by 10,000 times 10,000 angels singing, Worthy is the Lamb. What an amazing, glorious vision of worship. Uh, this is what God sees. This is the, the lens through which God then uh, views the world. It's amazing and immediately just takes us out of time and space into this realm of God. And it is so much more than it is even possible to describe. So now we're going to look at the seal, trumpet, and bull judgments. Uh, so this is the part of Revelation for which there are many interpretations, many, so much. Uh, I can't even get into all the distinctions between them. Certainly, uh, we have to make at least one determination before we proceed, and that's what do we believe about these judgments. Some people think that they're given in a chronological sequence that, you know, each follows the next, that they're all distinct in time. Other people believe that the seals, trumpets, and bowls in some way overlap, not necessarily perfectly, but there are overlaps here. And I, this is the one I'm, I'm in this camp. I do think that's true. Uh, each of the judgments concludes with a description of the day of the Lord. Each of them has a gap between the sixth and the seventh judgment. So it seems like there's a way in which they kind of overlay each other. Again, perhaps not perfectly. Uh, there might be, you know, some that are distinct, but certainly I think it's not, we're not talking chronological sequence anymore because now we're seeing God's perspective and time is just different with God. So between each of the sets of judgments, there are also episodes that provide insight into the church and the kind of the nature of the church's mission at the time that all of this is happening. So the seals, these judgments remind us of imagery and events from the Old Testament, including the plagues in Egypt and even some of the prophetic visions. There is a pause between the sixth and seventh seals that depicts the sealing of the 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. This is a symbolic number referring to a remnant, but a, a pretty sizable remnant. 
There's a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language wearing white robes and holding palm branches. These are described as the people who have come out of the great tribulation. What does that mean? Um, some people literally I think they're talking about the final years of human you know, timeline, the last seven years of existence. Some people think this is referring to all believers from the time of Christ. Uh, who knows? Whatever the case, whoever this group of people are, they will have no more tears. And then I have a slide in the presentation on the seals and just kind of recapping each of them. I'm not going to go into detail because we just don't have time. If you don't have access to this, you can just Google as well if you want to get there. There's tons of charts available that you could print off that kind of summarize each of the, of the judgments. Uh, before the next set of judgments, there's a pause between seals and trumpets uh, that an angel offers incense and the prayers of all God's people rise up before God. It's such a cool image, a thing to think about. Uh, once that censer is empty, it is filled with holy fire and hurled to earth, beginning the trumpet. So remember, fire signifies holiness. This is fire coming from God's throne room. So this is like now holy judgment going back to earth to judge the earth. The trumpets, again, reminding us of the plagues in Exodus. Uh, like those plagues, some of the trumpet judgments affect all people and some only affect the people who are not sealed by God. There's a pause between the sixth and seventh, just like we have with the seals, except in this pause, um, seven thunders speak and John is not permitted to tell us what they said. Uh, so one scholar wrote, well, why even put this in here then if we don't get to know what they said to you? Um, and he said, maybe the idea is that there are mysteries that God alone knows, and we're supposed to be reminded of that. And I, I think that that's a good, good way to think about this. Uh, first of all, all of this prophecy, like we're not going to know exactly what it's going to look like. It's just not possible. Uh, we can speculate, but we, when the time comes, who even knows? And there are some things that will be actually complete surprises to us. And so I'm, gl I'm glad, actually, that that's in there. Uh, we see that John eats the scroll that the angel gives him. And this is exactly what happened to Ezekiel when he was prophesying. He ate the scroll as well. Um, and so this legitimizes John's role as a prophet. And we remember from the books of the prophets that if they had time and space, they would do this. They would legitimize, like, I really am a prophet of God. Here's my call story. And so John has that included in here as well. And I just think it's cool that's the exact same story as Ezekiel. And that Ezekiel was the one that saw the dry bones. And God said, can these bones live? And indeed, God brought those bones back to life. And it's just some really cool overlays of people and context and images from scripture. Uh, so John's prophecy concerns events on earth during the final tribulation. So here's where we definitely have called out the end times. And he measures the temple, but not the outer court. So what is this temple? Some people think it's uh, a temple that is replacing the one that was destroyed in Jerusalem. And that it's either one set up by the Antichrist himself, or it's set up you know, built before the Antichrist time by Jews living in Jerusalem. Uh, this is why some Christians support a Jewish desire to rebuild the temple, and they will give monetarily to that effort because they believe once that temple is built, then that's going to hasten Jesus' return. Uh, but it could be that this temple is built by the Antichrist himself. Again, we don't know because it's prophecy. The idea being there is a rebuilt temple. The Antichrist is going to set up worship of himself in that place. Despite this, there will be two witnesses from God. Some think potentially Moses and Elijah brought back. Uh, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. These witnesses will witness to the gospel for a time before they are killed. And then after three and a half days, they will be resurrected and taken into heaven, followed by a great earthquake. And then we have uh, the trumpet slide. The last three trumpet judgments are also called woes. And again, you can Google all this if you want to get like a nice chart for yourself that makes it a little more easy to read. 
before the final set of bowl judgments, there's now a long interlude describing the opposition between the false worshipers of the Antichrist and the worshipers of the real Christ. Now, on the one hand, this is absolutely talking about Rome and the followers of Jesus existing in the first century world. And on the other hand, there are tons of allusions to the end times in which another Rome-like power will rule over believers. Uh, in this segment, imagery is used that was common in the time of the Old Testament. Uh, so like Genesis, we're going to see a recapturing of some of these images in light of the one true God. So we're kind of beginning, ending as we've begun. There's also a lot of imagery that recalls the visions of Daniel. So here, let's talk about this imagery. We've got a woman clothed with the sun, moon, and 12 stars. This was an ancient Near Eastern image, here now used to symbolize the people of God. Um, she has a child, and that child is meant to symbolize Jesus. There is what's called the Trinity of Evil, the dragon, which was another ancient Near Eastern image, and the two beasts. The dragon equals Satan. The beast out of the sea is Rome or the Antichrist in the end times. And then the beast from the earth is some kind of demonic spirit or false prophet. So in John's time, it could be equated with the religious rulers of Rome, the, the people leading the cult of the emperor. And then at the end times, it's going to be some kind of false prophet who is witnessing to the Antichrist. Uh, so in ancient Canaanite mytholo mythology, they spoke of the sea as home to a beast named Leviathan. Leviathan was a serpent who opposed God, and God's victory would be over the serpent and forces of evil in the sea. So note, there's, there's a bit of this in the New Testament. Jesus walks on water, remember, and that's symbolic of his, you know, status as Lord over everything, and that he even walks upon the forces of darkness, that indeed everything falls under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Also in Job, we saw reference to Leviathan and Behemoth, and God kind of explaining to Job that God is in command of everything, including these two great beasts. So the one head here, there's, they talk about one head that had a fatal wound but was healed. This is absolutely meant to symbolize Nero. He committed suicide, but no one saw it. I think just like one of his aides. And so the lore became that he actually didn't die, that he either was still alive or that he had been brought back from the dead somehow and that he was still kind of behind the scenes uh, ruling Rome. So that is directly speaking to Nero. The beast from the earth is going to uh, convince earth dwellers to worship the beast from the sea and to wear its mark on their right hand or forearm. So in John's time, this is that certificate that they would get saying that they worshipped Rome and that would allow them to engage in commerce and trade. And then at the end times, something similar, some kind of mark that allows people to, to participate in economic and commercial trade, and that believers will be prohibited from participating in. The, this mark is the number 666. Uh, so John doesn't name the beast, again, because to do so, if it got in the wrong hands, and he actually calls this out as being symbolic of Rome and the emperor cult, uh, the whole weight of Rome is going to come after these churches. So he has to hide all this in symbol, symbolism. And they this was something that they did with numbers. So he associates the beast with this number, and he says it's the number of a man. Um, so this was common. They would assign letters numerical values that added together specified a name. So scholars have calculated that these numbers equal the name Nero. Uh, in addition, scholars point to it as being the number of a man and falling short of the perfect number, which is seven. Conversely, on the same scale, Jesus' name would equal the numbers 888. That exceeds the perfect number, just as Christ exceeds all of humanity's hopes for redemption. He is more than we can imagine. So the idea here, the beast is not an equal of Jesus. It falls well short. It is just a man at the end, no matter how horrific, and can indeed be conquered and will be conquered by Jesus. 
So uh, the dragon, Satan, tries to attack the woman and her main male child, but he does not prevail. This is symbolic of Rome trying to destroy the church. The child, Jesus, is resurrected, ascends to heaven, and the woman, um, the followers of Jesus, flee into the wilderness. This happened in the first century. Uh, the believers in Jerusalem had to flee. They went across the Jordan River and into the wilderness just before Nero showed up to lay siege to the city. Uh, so this is something that had already happened. In the next scene, the dragon authorizes the beasts of the sea and the earth to emerge. The sea beast blasphemes the church and wins the worship of those who refuse Jesus while persecuting and ruling over the church. The earth beast bears false witness and performs signs and wonders that also win the worship of those who refuse Jesus. This beast forces people to bear the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. So this is probably Nero again as the sea beast. Um, he was the emperor that began in earnest persecution of believers. And then the earth beast being the false uh, religion of the emperor, which would call for worshiping the emperor of Rome. Um, and then again, they couldn't. You know, they got that certificate that would allow that would allow people to engage in trade. So this represents Rome's complete control of the region, persecution of believers, again, to the point that so many of them were excluded from commerce and trade. And in Revelation 13, 10, it says this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Um, the continued refrain of this book is it is going to be OK. Hang in there. Be patient. God will vindicate you. And that we're going to see in the explicit end times uh, prophecy. So meanwhile, sometime in the future, uh, we get another vision of Mount Zion. And here the lamb stands with 144,000 who have been sealed for him. Uh, again, perhaps this is the remnant of Israel who now believes in Jesus and came to faith during the, the great tribulation, that final seven year period. Um, they're described as being virgins. This could be very symbolic. Israel was called the virgin daughter of Zion in several places in the Old Testament, or it could mean literal virginity. I, who knows? Uh, an angel announces that the hour of judgment has come and that Babylon has fallen. Um, so this is referencing Rome. Uh, so those who have worshipped the beast or its image and taken its mark or name will be judged and subjected to eternal torment. Uh, so this can refer to the immediate future of John because Rome indeed would fall. It's, it would still be a while. This is like late first century and Rome fell around the mid 400s. But it also speaks to the end times when history will repeat him, itself and the new Rome, the seat of the new Antichrist, will also fall. The idea Every human kingdom, empire, ruler will fall or die eventually. Uh, only God is sovereign. Only God lasts forever. Everything else has an end point to it. And then we get the bull judgments. Again, drawing on familiar imagery from the Old Testament. Uh, again, there's a gap between the sixth and seventh. Here we see a great army and amassed an evil army that gathers at Armageddon to fight the Lord. Uh, this is the Valley of Megiddo. This is right outside the ruins of Ahab and Jezebel's winter palace. And it's in the shadow of Mount Carmel where Elijah had the showdown with the prophets of Baal. Uh, with the seventh bull, a loud voice says, it is done. This reminds us of Jesus' final words on the cross where he cries out, it is finished. And this is followed by such a strong earthquake that the earth is essentially flattened. And we remember when Jesus died on the cross, it was followed by a tremendous earthquake. So just so many cool overlays of time and parallels of things going on in scripture, past, relatively present, and future. And here's a picture of that valley. You can see the remnant of Ahab and Jezebel's palace, and then just this enormous agricultural area. It's just farmland, but it's it's quite extensive where this army will gather. And then I have another slide going over the seven bowls in particular. So now the stage is set from his throne. God announced it is done, signifying the end of this great tribulation. As terrifying as these events have been, they have accomplished a few things. They have proven indeed that God is sovereign and mighty. 
They have proven that the Antichrist, the false prophet, are not, that there they are things that can be defeated. They may have been able to show a few signs and wonders themselves, that false prophet, but they are nothing in comparison to God and Jesus, and only God can level the earth. And again, though terrifying, these judgments provided humans with a chance for repentance, just like the plagues in Exodus. Remember in Exodus that the people that emerged from Egypt aren't just Hebrews, but there's a lot of Egyptians and people from other ancient Near Eastern communities that follow along because everyone sees the plagues and says, okay, God must really be God. <laughs> and even Rahab, who they encounter uh, in in um, Jericho, she's like, I know what happened and I believe that your God is God. So this is like a final chance, definitively, definitively proving God's sovereignty and calling all people to believe in him. But note that those who remain, who survive all of this, uh, there's a big chunk of them that say they still curse God. But also note at this point, there doesn't seem to be doubt anymore. We know in our modern day world, a lot of people just doubt that God exists altogether. At this point, it's not doubt about God's existence. It's whether or not people want to choose to follow him. And so the stage is set for the ultimate showdown at Armageddon. All right. So that brings us to an end of part one. Next up will be part two. And we'll see how Revelation ends. See you for part two in a bit.